On this episode of Pilot's Discretion, we're joined by Bruce Landsberg, Vice Chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board. He tells us the number one cause of general aviation accidents, what lessons we can learn from the airline safety record, and how the NTSB accident investigation process works. Pilot's Discretion starts right now. Hello, everyone. I'm John Zimmerman of Sporties, and thanks for listening. Remember to visit sporties.com slash podcast for show links and complete archives, and send your comments to podcast at sporties.com. Today, I am honored to have Bruce Landsberg with us, who probably knows more about aviation safety than anyone in the world right now. For the last four years, he has served as vice chairman of the NTSB, bringing an experienced pilot's perspective to this important organization. Before joining the NTSB, Bruce was at AOPA for two decades, leading their safety efforts and collaborating with a number of industry groups, including the General Aviation Joint Steering Committee and NASA's Aviation Safety Reporting System. He is an ATP and a flight instructor and logs a lot of time in a beach bonanza. Bruce, welcome to Pilot's Discretion. Thanks very much, John. It's a pleasure to be with you and uh, all of your listeners. Let's start with maybe the bad news, but I think a very important topic, which is fatal GA accidents. So what's killing pilots right now? What do we need to be on the lookout for? Well, you know, one of the questions we get asked or people seem to ask a lot is, uh, what's the trend? What's happening? And with few exceptions, everything is pretty much flat, maybe slightly down. And it all depends on how much flying we're actually doing. The more we fly, the more we seem to get exposed to uh, problems. Probably one of the worst areas uh, in terms of fatalities is VFR into IMC. Not so much numerically, but just in terms of typically in the high 90%. If if you get into a cloud and you're not prepared to deal with it, um, it's going to be a final outcome on that. And we're averaging um, about 11 crashes a year. We went back and prep for this podcast and looked at a a 15-year period because spikes in small numbers oftentimes will lead you to a bad conclusion. So VFR into IMC, over that period, there were 164 uh, crashes um, and were averaging, uh, as I say, about 11 per year or one a month. So my question I like to ask is, what part of cloud don't you understand if you're not instrument rated current and on a flight plan? So the admonishment there is just don't do it. Um, And some people get away with it for a while. We see that and uh, we could have a long conversation on that topic. Uh, Another very popular area, fortunately not a lot of fatalities are referred to as runway excursions. And that's where people leave the runway, typically not at a taxiway. And it is either off the end or off the side. And um, there are a lot of those. Uh, Over the 15-year period, there were over 400. And um, we're averaging about 30 a month or one a day. And it can be generally uh, somebody going off the end. Uh, Business jets seem to like to do that quite a bit. And then uh, with light airplanes, um, they either go off the end or off the side. Sometimes the wind is at fault, and sometimes it's the pilot's footwork in in both cases. Um, Mid-air collisions, it's always a a hot topic. And over the 15-year period, uh, uh, there were about um, 104 of those were back Early in the in the period, we were averaging about eight per year. And I was kind of interested in this because, as you know, in 2020, the FAA mandated ADSB. And I'd had the privilege of flying airplanes with collision avoidance for quite a while. And at first I thought, eh, how big a deal is that? Well, I can tell you, once you've had it, you can never go back <laughs> because you will feel absolutely naked without it and be just absolutely flabbergasted at the amount of traffic that you don't see, even when it's pointed out to you by a controller. So early in the period, 
uh, up until about 2020, there were an average of eight per year. It's now dropped to about five per year. So that's very roughly about a 40% uh, reduction. And I, th- I think that's, uh, that's worthy of note. And there are going to be some people who say, well, you know, I don't really need that. I don't fly a lot or the airplane I have doesn't, uh, doesn't have uh, the systems that I need. And I would very simply say, unless you're in very uncongested airspace, this is a good thing to have. So um, last area that I thought was kind of interesting and something that's near and dear to all of our hearts and, and every flight instructor is that of engine failure. And I don't count pilots not getting fuel to the aircraft uh, engine as an engine failure. That's a pilot failure. And there are two kinds, as you know, there's exhaustion and there's starvation. Uh, Exhaustion means there's nothing left and there will be no fire. And starvation means there's fuel somewhere on the airplane, but the pilot just didn't figure out how to get it to the engine. So on engine stoppages, uh, there were literally thousands over the, over the time period. We're averaging about 200 per year, which is a lot, um, roughly two per day, give or take a little. And the good news is that only about 10% of those are fatal. My concern with this, however, is that a lot of that is due to chance. It depends on where and when the engine decides to pack it in. If it happens shortly after takeoff, if you're in Kansas and you got nothing but cornfields and wheat fields down there, you're in luck. If you're taking off in a congested area, uh, chances are it's going to be a bad outcome. And likewise, um, in the mountain terrain and things of that nature, uh, it's, it's a bit problematic. So that's that's kind of the area in a nutshell. So, um, yeah, it's any, fasc- any questions? Yeah, fascinating stats across the board. There, uh, the the midair one I think is very interesting. Obviously, midair has been in the news recently with with some accidents, uh, but it seems like a, a healthy trend there. I wonder, is there any lesson to be learned there for VFR into IMC? While that is fundamentally a decision making failure. Is there some technology piece there that can help? Is it data link weather? Is it autopilots? Is it weather cameras? Is it some new weather forecast? Is there something there that could uh, that could serve a similar role to the ADSB traffic? Well, the easiest the easy answer is all of the above. But let's let's take those down in order. Uh, first off, since we the advent of automated weather reporting, uh, ASOS and AWOS at the airports, you've gotten literally hundreds of more reporting points. And so the old VFR not recommended where they would way overworn. There was a defensive forecasting, if you will. Um, that's largely gone by the board because you can take a look uh, in any pre-flight weather brief and get a pretty good idea of where the weather is. So uh, I think Using your, your iPad or a uh, similar tablet would, can really help you. For heaven's sakes, get a briefing ahead of time and do, uh, flight service is helpful. Uh, I like to have a picture, so I do it online and, and find that to give me a very good idea. And the things are getting updated, uh, at least hourly in most cases and in other cases more frequently than that. Temperature dew point, that's one of those old ground school things that we talk about. That should have you on alert, particularly in the evening hours when the temperature is coming down. In the mornings, close temperature and dew point may not be quite as critical uh, as the sun comes up because that's going to uh, cause things to spread out. And that's where we get a lot of marine layer uh, kinds of circumstances that if you wait a couple of hours, it's, it's going to be fine. One area that I'm a huge proponent of, and I would like to see a lot more done, is in pilot reports, because that helps to verify that the weather is, in fact, what they said. It wasn't just the weather folks crying wolf, that the wolf is actually out there. Sometimes the wolf isn't there, uh, and it's good to know that and then say, okay, it's safe to fly. 
So I would really like to encourage people to give Pyreps, uh, not only when the weather is not what they forecast, but also if it was what they forecast, because uh, that gives the forecaster some data. And uh, if you're talking to ATC, that's a that's a good way of doing it. You need to sort of ask uh, because sometimes they're busy and it's just simple enough. Uh, uh, in my case, uh, Bonanza 6-7 Tango, uh, time for a pie wrap. And then most of the time they'll say, sure, go ahead or stand by, which means they're listening on other frequencies and things of that nature. So you're not getting into a long-winded conversation when they don't have time to do it. But uh, pie reps are, are a huge help. Icing is still something of an enigma, uh, and, and we struggle with that because uh, it's hard to know exactly. There are a lot of factors that go into icing. So icing pie reps or lack thereof, this is where icing may be forecast or could be there. Uh, if you pass along a pie rep and say, hey, no ice, that may help somebody else to complete a trip. It's not a guarantee, but it helps you to get a better picture of, of what's going on. Um, did I cover that uh, sufficiently or do you need more? No, that's uh, that's very interesting. I, I wonder the question on autopilots too. Is there, oh. we certainly hope that no VFR pilot stumbles into IMC, but if heaven forbid they do, is there a role there not just the technology, but the training? I, I worry that some pilots are flying with autopilots they don't know how to use. Uh, that, great. Thank you for bringing that up. Absolutely. Uh, perhaps the landmark crash for using autopilots was JFK Jr. Uh, going into the uh, the ocean. Uh, the He was VFR. He was uh, partly trained on instruments. He'd made the trip out to the islands uh, a number of times with instructors. Uh, this was after dark. The weather wasn't as good as forecast. It was pretty hazy out there, and he should have been aware of the fact that even when they say the weather is good, there's a lot of moisture, and the microclimates around the islands uh, can lead you to a bad place in a hurry. The flight track tells a story because he was absolutely on a perfect flight track until he started the descent, and then you can see the heading start to wander. Now, I won't, I guess I would have to admit that I have the same problem because as soon as I turn off my autopilot and go back and look, you can see little variations here and there along the way. But it tells us uh, that the autopilot is, is either engaged or disengaged. Had he left the autopilot on, that crash most likely would not have occurred, but he became spatially disoriented. One other point on VFR and to IMC. Generally speaking, it isn't the first time that somebody gets into it. Uh, I went to a crash early in my tenure on the board of uh, another bonanza um, in a midwestern state, and um, it was it was a by our uh, definition a, a pretty basic kind of situation, and looking. The airplane hit the ground at over 180 knots, all in one place. Uh, nobody walked away from this one. It, I mean, it just it's very, very sobering to see those kinds of things. The weather was not forecast, but again, this goes back to what kind of what part of cloud don't you understand? And we went back, looked at the ADSB track, and it was very clear that the pilot was maneuvering the aircraft both vertically and horizontally to try to pick his way through. We also went back, because we have a paid subscription, uh, to uh, look at uh, uh, past history. And it wasn't this guy's first rodeo in trying to game the weather. And I am certain that in most of these cases, people have gotten an element of success. And Bill Gates has a great quote that says, success is a lousy teacher. So if you've never been bitten, you think, oh, well, this, this isn't going to be too bad. I can manage it. And this airplane, to your autopilot point, was fully equipped with an autopilot. What needed to happen was make sure it's in altitude hold mode, 
take the heading bug and turn it back to where the weather was better. That's all that needed to be done. Fascinating, fascinating stats and, and tragic outcomes, but hopefully lessons learned. And, and one of the lessons I constantly try to learn is from the airlines who have really made an unbelievable strides in safety. I want to read you something I, I recently read from author and pilot James Fallows, uh, who I thought summed it up well where we are with airlines. He said, quote, airplanes weighing up to a half a million pounds hurtle into the sky, carrying hundreds of passengers who are separated by thin sheets of aluminum and plastic from air so cold and thin it would kill them quickly on exposure. Passengers gaze out at engines up to one-tenth as powerful as those that sent Apollo 13 towards the moon. At the end of the journey, the pilots bring the plane down on a precise strip of pavement, perhaps 60 seconds after the plane ahead of them in the queue, 60 seconds before the next one. And we take it all for granted, grumbling about the crowds and the hassle and the pretzels and the legroom, but safe. It really is amazing when you think about it, how many people every day get on an airliner and fly with incredible safety. So how do we do that? And what can we learn from that as GA pilots? Uh, Great, great question. Um, There are a lot of things. And years ago, NTSB used to say, well, why can't general aviation be more like the airlines? And um, if you're a movie buff, you would maybe ask the question a different way. Um, Professor Henry Higgins in My Fair Lady said, why can't a woman be more like a man? When I asked my senior female staff at AOPA what they thought of it, their response was wonderful. They said, why would she want to be? So (laughs) I decided I was in way over my head and stopped there. But, you know, the airlines have a lot of differences and equating them is like trying to match apples to kumquats. Uh, The aircraft, in most cases, are completely different than ours. They're multi-engine turbine airplanes certified to part 25, very few single point failures, typically crewed by two pilots who are type rated, well-trained. They operate under a much more strict set of regulations uh, than we do under, under part 91. They're going into uh, specially prepared airports, so they don't go to some of the places that uh, GA does. The margins are all figured out in advance. And so about the only thing we have in common is that we sometimes fly in the same airspace. Now, all of that said, your point is there are some things that we can do, uh, particularly in light general aviation to begin to emulate some of the airline's uh, procedures. Um, In the business jet world, where they perform uh, in the same mindset, they match or exceed the airlines in their safety record. For light GA, um, that's impossible to do, but we can get closer. First off is Everybody talks about it, and I get tired of hearing about it and saying it, but it's establishing some margins. So one area, for example, is um, in uh, aircraft performance, uh, the pilot operating handbook, and they will tell you right down to the foot how many feet it's going to take to get airborne over the famous 50-foot obstacle. If you go back and you look at all of the conditions that go into that, you should come to the realization that you and I will never duplicate those conditions because we aren't test pilots. Our airplane is not going to be in factory fresh, perfect condition. The tires are probably not perfectly inflated. The runway isn't necessarily level and dry, and the obstacle may be significantly more than 50 feet. And John, do you know how much you clear the 50-foot obstacle by? Zero. (laughs) It's exactly 50 feet. And if you've flown over some trees, I can tell you I'm much happier being about 30 to 40 feet above those trees because they look really big. Absolutely. So Air Safety uh, Institute, we we came up with uh, what we call the 50-50 solution back in the day. Uh, that said, uh, whatever the book says will get you into or out of the airport uh, at 50 feet, um, add 50% to that. So if it, let's arbitrarily say it's going to take you, uh, oh, 
1,800 feet uh, under the best of circumstances to get over the uh, obstacle, add 900 feet to that. Can you do it in less? Absolutely. But you're not dependent upon it. And sometimes you'll get a, a, a wind shift or something like that that they don't deal with in the test conditions that'll put you in the trees if you're doing it right at the margin. So that's that's one item. Secondly is uh, weather. You know, the fact that you were tested once upon a time to fly to uh, ILS minimums doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to do it every single day, day in, day out, after a long day of work and then uh, flying back at 10 o'clock at night. And I have a, a hard stop for me that typically after about 10 o'clock at night, depending on the day, I'm not flying anywhere. I'm just done. And because you're now getting on the backside of the clock, uh, that's, that's an issue. The airlines have strict fatigue requirements. Obviously, uh, medications is a big issue. And um, we could have a long conversation about uh, medication. Um, I, I won't go into it here, but uh, as I say, that could, that could be something else. Um, training. I can't say enough about the importance of periodic training. And I think you would agree to it. Sporty's Academy uh, does it. And, and in my prior life, prior to AOPA, I was at Flight Safety International, uh, visited Southwest Airlines here just a couple of weeks ago. And the amount of effort that is put into training uh, is one of the key reasons why the airlines have such a good safety record. So in my world, because, yeah, I fly a fair amount, but obviously uh, um, I don't get challenged much. The airplane is pretty reliable. I work hard at that. And uh, so how do, you, how do you stretch your envelope a little bit to deal with the uh, unexpected? And that's through periodic training. I'm a big fan of simulators. And if you can find a good simulator uh, for uh, your aircraft that duplicates your avionics, hey, go for it. So all of those things, again, we could have a, a much longer conversation than what we have here to talk about some of those benefits. Bruce, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, let's talk about the NTSB's role. Earn your pilot's license, get current, or add a rating. No matter what your goal is, Sporty's Pilot Training App will save you time and money. It's available on all your devices, including iPad, iPhone, Android, and smart TVs, so you can access Sporty's award-winning courses anywhere. Plus, with automatic sync between platforms and free lifetime updates, you'll always be current. Over 25 courses are available, from private pilot to aerobatics. Visit sporties.com slash courses for a free trial. Now, back to pilot's discretion. We are back with NTSB Vice Chairman Bruce Landsberg. And Bruce, one other thing that comes up in the airline world is the concept of flight data monitoring. It goes by lots of different names, FOQA and some other things like that. Explain what that means and why a GA pilot might care about that concept. So the concept of flight data monitoring grew out of uh, flight data recorders and, and cockpit voice recorders, which have been on airliners for decades. And initially, we said we'd like to see, you know, crash worthy uh, devices. Well, that's pretty expensive. and some would say, well, it's very self-serving for NTSB because when we've got devices on board the aircraft, it makes it pretty simple to figure out the what, the why, and, and, and how it can be prevented. But I want to take a slightly different tack on this uh, as an aircraft owner myself. And uh, the most critical part that I have is uh, uh, the engine. I can deal with a lot of other stuff, but if the engine isn't working properly, it's going to be forward and down. So. Uh, I put an engine monitor on my airplane, and not only do I have the engine monitor, but I also get the data analyzed uh, about every couple of months just to get a trend reporting, see how the engine is doing. And if you're not doing that, you're missing out on a great preventive kind of a thing. The temperatures of the engine, 
Uh, obviously, the other things that you should be doing as far as engines are bore scoping on a, on a regular basis, taking a look at the, uh, the valves and the condition of the pistons and so on, and then doing uh, oil analysis uh, on a regular basis to see if the thing is making metal. And those are all preventive kinds of things because we really would like to avoid that critical uh, single point failure that we have in light airplanes. The other thing that I think, and this this does not represent the board's opinion, so I, I want to be very clear on that, but a lot of people are still concerned about um, product liability and the fact that the legal system extracts large amounts of money uh, from uh, manufacturers when, in fact, it was the pilot that was the self-inflicted wound, if you will. Flight data monitoring largely resolves a good part of that because we then get to see what the pilot was doing and, and, and what the aircraft was doing. And in most cases, it's going, the aircraft is doing exactly what the pilot told it to do. So if you feel like you're paying too much for insurance, um, this would be a good way to start to address it. And I'd like to see the manufacturers really encourage it. And on the new airplanes, they're pretty well equipped. And to the extent that they can harden those at least somewhat uh, will accrue to everyone's benefit. I think it would be a great thing for safety as well. Let's, uh, let's hope that happens. I want to ask you quickly about the NTSB's role, uh, and then we'll get to our ready to copy segment, because I think a lot of pilots, a lot of Americans in general, take the NTSB for granted, but it's a critical organization, I think, and one that not all countries have. So explain to us why you think the accident investigation process is important, why that's important. It's an independent body, what the result of that is long term. Great question. Um, NTSB uh, was was uh, formed back in the late '60s, and it was originally put under uh, the Department of Transportation. And there were probably about three to four major air carrier crashes a year back in those days. And we needed to get a better understanding of what was going on and why. Around the early 70s, however, uh, then President Nixon decided that there was too much political uh, influence being exerted upon the board. And so uh, he made the change to pull NTSB out from under DOT and make us a totally independent organization. Now, that infuriates some people because we are not susceptible to uh, political influence. And the board members are made up of both parties. Uh, I'm pleased to say I think my colleagues are about as apolitical as I am. Uh, I like to call myself an equal opportunity insulter. And uh, uh, it's, it's a really good system. Our, the board is appointed by the uh, or nominated by the president, confirmed by the Senate. So it's the same kind of process that the Supreme Court goes through, um, a little less contentious, we hope, but um, uh, you generally get a, a pretty good quality, I like to think, uh, of, of people and a good cross-section uh, background. Right now, uh, uh, I'm currently the only active pilot on the board, but uh, um, Member Graham is a uh, uh, former Navy pilot. Uh, uh, Chair Homendy uh, has a great background in, in railroad uh, kinds of things. And member Chapman also has some aviation background. So we've got a pretty uh, eclectic mix and we do have one opening uh, that we uh, we need to fill. So that's, that's the board's portion of it. We are political appointees, even though I like to think we are apolitical. Our job is to sort of guide the agency. The hard work, though, is done by the professional staff. And I can't say enough about the dedication and enthusiasm that these people have. They come to the board, not for the money, but because they really like what they're doing. And uh, we operate across every mode. So most people know us for the aviation side of things, but we do uh, marine uh, safety and in co collaboration with the Coast Guard, uh, railroad, uh, 
we work uh, with the railroads uh, closely and the uh, uh, Federal uh, Railroad Administration. Highway is is a big area right now, and we we spend a lot of time on highway. And then the other area is pipeline and hazardous materials. And each area has its own office, and we have specialists in those areas that uh, are capable of going out doing a full-blown investigation, and then uh, things get edited. We also have a laboratory, our research and engineering division, that uh, spends a lot of time picking apart uh, details. You may recall a couple of years ago, uh, a uh, Piper um, Arrow lost a wing down in Florida. And I actually got to see the the piece that, that came in, and our we have a super electron microscope, and they went through and looked at that thing six ways to Sunday and then got it uh, uh, figured out what happened and, and where to go from there. So a lot of times people are frustrated with the amount of time it takes to get uh, a crash investigated. I can tell you that in a lot of cases, it doesn't take that long, and uh, we've actually uh, implemented a performance improvement process, and you are starting to see uh, crash updates on the simple crashes out in about six to eight months. And these are just same stuff, different day kinds of circumstances. We don't go out on all of the crashes because A, we're not staffed to do so, and B, uh, we entrust the investigation to the FAA, but the, the buck stops with us. And if we see something that we think needs more attention, uh, we'll, we'll ask to get that. As some of the crashes, though, get more complicated, and instant analysis doesn't always serve well, and we have to, we don't speculate on these kinds of things. That's just our, our policy, and I can give you several examples. I won't take the time now, but maybe uh, downstream, we can talk about several examples where it was perfectly obvious that this is what happened, and that isn't what happened at all. So in a light, typical light GA crash, uh, the most basic ones, you're looking at probably six to eight months for the uh, final report. Preliminary, preliminary reports will be out within two weeks. Factual reports, probably in five months or so, and then the final will be uh, put out then. The board doesn't look, the board members don't look at all of the general aviation crashes because we wouldn't then be able to do anything else. So we delegate those to uh, the head of the uh, Aviation Safety Division, uh, Tim LeBaron, who uh, is a active general aviation pilot and an A&P. So he is very well qualified uh, to do this. Uh, the more complicated ones could take, you know, a year, and I'll point out uh, TWA 800, which was the one where uh, we had a fuel tank explosion on a Boeing 747 uh, uh, back in the uh, late 90s, and that one took several years to to figure that one out. And it's it, I think it's one of the finest examples of accident investigation uh, ever. So. That's that's kind of how uh, the system works. When an accident uh, report is published, if somebody has or takes exception to it, they can petition for reconsideration if they are uh, part of the uh, uh, party uh, system. And we'll take a look at it uh, and put it back into the system. It won't go to the same accident investigator because we don't want them checking themselves. If they have new creditable data, in a lot of cases, however, they just didn't like the outcome, so they come up with some excuse of, "Well, you guys didn't do this." Um, the legal system has a different objective, and this is something that I didn't really understand until I came to the board. And that was, our job is to look for the what, the why, and how it can be prevented. The legal system looks at redress of grievances. And so the objectives are quite different, and frequently um, they will take us to task for saying, well, you didn't dig deep enough on this, or 
this could have happened. Uh, there's a hypothetical case, and we have all kinds of history. Their objective is to win money. Our job is to see if there's something that is likely to uh, happen again and, and to make sure that everybody is aware of it and how it can be prevented. Yeah, there's a great line in many NTSB documents. You'll see it. Assignment of fault or legal liability is not relevant to the NTSB's statutory mission to improve transportation safety. And I always read that and think, thank God, because what we really want to do is learn how not to have that happen to us. So it's a good thing. Bruce, we're down to our final segment, which we call Ready to Copy. I'll ask some questions on a wide variety of topics, and you give me your quick answer. Feel free to pass if you'd like. Are you ready to copy? Uh, I am. And I will tell you that uh, after having been in Washington, I've learned how to say absolutely nothing and sound semi-intelligent doing so, and also to pivot, which means I want if I want to talk about something else, I will do that. <laughs> well, we're going to put you on the spot right out of the gate here. Okay, ready to copy. Should more airplanes have an angle of attack indicator? I think that would be a good idea. You know, we spend a huge amount of time as flight instructors trying to explain this whole concept of AOA. And um, the Navy uses it to great effect all the time. They fly AOA. They don't fly airspeed. And so uh, I'm a firm believer in it. And it was something we put on the line uh, when I was at the JSC to get the FAA to back off from a horrendous certification program to say, look, we can we can make this work. Should more airplanes have a parachute on board? Uh, that's a good question. Um, it certainly doesn't hurt. And Cirrus have, have demonstrated the value of parachutes. Obviously, there is a weight penalty. There's some complication penalties. But I can tell you, um, if it is used intelligently, it, uh, it certainly has merit. What's one maneuver pilots should be practicing more often, either during initial flight training, a flight review, or just on their own? What's a good maneuver that gets overlooked? Crosswind landings. That's that runway excursion number you brought up earlier, right? Lots of those. <laughs> well, let me just expand just a little bit. You know, as flight instructors, we're always telling students to stay coordinated. That is, when you put in right aileron, you put in right rudder. And when you touch down, let's keep the wings level. Guess what? In a crosswind, we tell them to do exactly the opposite. And so it takes a little while to kind of pat your head and rub your stomach at the same time. And I know from my experience as a flight instructor, there was never a good crosswind around when you really needed one. If you were king for a day, what aviation rule would you change? Well, I need to think about that one just a little bit. Um, let me get back to you on that one because... Boy, what a great question. Um, I need to think for a moment. So <laughs> next question. You worked at Flight Safety, as you mentioned, before coming to AOPA at a time when the simulator industry was pretty new, kind of a, a novel idea at that time. Should we have more simulator flying for GA pilots? And how much does it matter if the actual avionics and cockpit matches your airplane? First question, the first part of the question is yes, absolutely. I'm a huge believer in, in simulation. We waste more av gas and time fumbling around trying to teach the basics. In fact, if you go to a, a flight school that does not use simulators much, you'll see them start the engine and then sit there for five, six minutes while they're kind of getting the things uh, uh, coordinated. Now, simulators are a huge benefit even basic ones, uh, teaching uh, basic four maneuvers and getting people to understand how flight controls interrelate and a bit of energy management and all of that can be done so much more efficiently uh, in a simulator. Now, ultimately, you have to go to the airplane. What I like to say is um, learning happens on the ground. Skill to apply comes in the air. So there is that. As far as the avionics, um, the good news was we got GPS, and it is phenomenally great equipment. The bad news is that the manufacturers created what I'll refer to as the Tower of Babel, and that is that everybody's got a better idea on how to do it. 
we're starting to see a little bit of similarity there, but unless you've used the a lot of different kinds of equipment, and I've had the misfortune of learning or having to learn about seven different IFR GPS units, and all of them had their their quirks. I think that there's uh, it's best to have the best possible duplication of what you're going to see in the aircraft, because otherwise you will have negative learning. And to the extent that simulators can a- adapt to that, uh, that's that's really important. Your Bonanza owner is the Bonanza the best single engine piston airplane ever built. <laughs> ah. Bonanza owners are very proud and justifiably so. So is it the one? Did Beach get it right all those years ago? Well. Whatever I say, I'm, I'm going to be in trouble. Uh, Mooney owners like to think that their airplanes are the best. Uh, Cirrus owners, likewise. So um, I think I will uh, sidestep that question. Um, I will say this. Uh, the Bonanza, the A36, is still in production, barely. Uh, but uh, uh, it's a remarkable machine. I've had the privilege of flying a lot of different airplanes. The nice part about it is... Uh, Certainly with the A36, it it does everything very well, and um, there's enough room in the back for my wife's luggage and shoes, and I can tell you uh, that's significant. So let's rewind in your career long ago. You were originally a missile launch officer in the Air Force, tending to an ICBM. Are there any procedures or habits from that world that we might apply to aviation? Uh yeah, there is. And many of my friends are still um, amazed that uh, they would entrust a young uh, lieutenant to such an important task. But um, you gain an appreciation for process and procedure and training when you're in that. Um, obviously, they were selective as to who they picked. In my case, that's somewhat debatable, but we'll let that pass. The the training was probably the best training I ever got. Uh, we did drills over and over and over again. And and oops was not in the vocabulary. A lot of people think, well, you know, you just push a button and the world as we know it comes to an end. There's a lot more to it than that. And in flying airplanes, I think we have to take some of the mindset that was well beaten into us early on. And, and that is pay attention to procedure, be mentally present. If you're not thinking about things, uh, if you're thinking about the office or a personal problem and you can't compartmentalize that, you really shouldn't be flying at that point because there are too many things that, w- that will happen. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I do think that that helped to prepare me. Our last question is always the same on this podcast. You have one final flight, and we want to know, what are you flying, and where are you going? Uh, one final flight? One last flight. What's it going to be? What airplane do you grab, and where do you go? Oh, well, I have no idea at this point. Uh, I will let circumstances dictate uh, that that particular point. I do want to offer one uh, item here that is off topic, but it is on NTSB's most wanted list, and it affects every one of us as pilots and that is distracted driving. If you have a cell phone or you have a big screen in your vehicle, please, please, please put your cell phone down and do not use it except for driving essential tasks such as navigation. Do not be talking on it or texting. We have an an incredible number of crashes. And here in aviation, we spend a tremendous amount of time focusing on safety. I can tell you right now, highways are far and away the worst. We're having the equivalent of three major airline crashes a week in fatalities on the highway. So I would ask all of the listeners there, I know it won't happen to you, of course. That's what every single person who's been in a a crash has said. It's not going to happen to me, but it does. Please put your phone on mute and It'll wait until you get to wherever you're going, or if it's something critical, you can find a safe place and pull over. Great advice. And for all the listeners listening to this right now in their cars, put the phone down. (laughs) Bruce, thanks for being on the podcast. 
It's been my great pleasure, John. I really look forward to uh, uh, working with you and with Sporties and with all the pilots out there to keep us safe. Thanks for listening to Pilot's Discretion, brought to you by Sporties, training and equipping pilots worldwide for over 60 years. For more episodes and today's show links, visit sporties.com slash podcast. I'm John Zimmerman. We'll see you next time on Pilot's Discretion.